This is the story of the heroic 5th Battery of the Wisconsin Independent Light Artillery which fought during the Civil War. My great-great-grandfather was one of the members of that battery. This is also the story of my quest to follow in the footsteps of that battery and to, through the generations, connect with my great-great-grandfather by visiting the Civil War battlefields and the campaigns that they were on all the way from southeast Missouri to North Carolina through several years of hard-fought battles. As my wife Debbie and I began our journey to explore Fred Block's part of the Civil War, our first stop was the small southeast Missouri town of New Madrid, a place that was of high strategic importance to the South at that time. In 1861, Confederate military officials and engineers determined this area was an ideal location to repel United States river boats from proceeding any further south on the Mississippi River. Not only did the S-shaped Madrid bend in the river give advantage to the occupying army, the Mississippi River was also experiencing spring flooding, making most of the surrounding land on both sides impassable swampland which provided a natural defense, hindering any land attacks from the Yankees. Using slave labor, they quickly built Fort Thompson and Fort Bankhead near New Madrid with artillery guns on both sides of the river. They also fortified and installed 30 heavy artillery guns on Island No. 10, so named because it was the 10th island south of the confluence of the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. In addition, the Confederates brought several gunboats and a floating battery to add to that firepower. On the night of March 13, 1862, Confederate General John McCown ordered his troops to abandon New Madrid after enduring more than 10 days of heavy artillery fire from the Union Army approaching from the north. Under cover of darkness and a severe thunderstorm, riverboats transported rebel troops across the Mississippi River. Union General John Pope's Army of the Mississippi took possession of New Madrid on March 14th, but the Confederate Army remained dug in with considerable artillery on Island No. 10 and the east bank of the Mississippi River. Preparing for a larger battle to come, the Union began bringing in reinforcements. It is at this point in time that great-great-grandfather Fred Block and the 5th Wisconsin Light Artillery left their training camp in Racine, Wisconsin. Traveling by riverboat from the shores of Lake Michigan, they continued down the Illinois River and entered the waters of the Mississippi River just north of St. Louis. One of the 5th Battery soldiers, Byron J. Bullard, wrote, At 4 p.m. the boat rounded to St. Louis and we were soon drawn up in line on the levee, and our arrival drew together a large crowd of spectators. At 6 o'clock we took up our line of march to Camp Benton, situated about five miles from the city preceded by our band. Our march through the city was quite an ovation. The people flocked to their doors and windows, and Union flags were displayed freely. A little after dark we arrived at Camp Benton, a tired set of boys. We were soon shown to our quarters, and after eating a little boiled beef and dry crackers, we were soon asleep on the rough boards with only a single blanket over us. Today nothing remains of the Camp Benton buildings. Once housing over a mile of barracks and the largest hospital west of the Mississippi for treating wounded soldiers, the property is now a city park where children play. It is known as the Old Fairground Park. On Tuesday, the 18th, the 5th Battery with three other Wisconsin batteries marched back to the Mississippi River and boarded a steamboat named John H. Dickey, which a few years earlier had been piloted by Samuel Clemens, later known as Mark Twain. Byron Bullard wrote again, We expected to leave immediately, but we were detained on account of some repairs being done to the boat until the next day. The boat, the city of Memphis, lay just above us, having on board some of the heroes of Fort Donaldson, our sick and wounded and a few of those who fell fighting for their country on that bloody battlefield. It was a sad sight to see them borne away in ambulances, some to hospitals and others to honored graves. The next day, the 19th, they were finally able to depart, arriving at the city of Cairo on the southern tip of Illinois. They crossed the river to Birds Point, Missouri. From there, they took the railroad 24 miles southwest to Sykeston. Bullard writes, 
We tumbled out of the cars in a hurry, unslung knapsacks, piled them up, and then formed in line and started for New Madrid some 32 miles distant on foot, feeling a little ticklish at not having any arms with us. They arrived at the fortifications of New Madrid on Friday the 21st. Debbie and I walked along the banks of the river near where the Wisconsin boys built new earthworks and set up their cannons. This would be the first time they would fire their guns in a true battle setting. William Ball of the 5th Battery wrote how they initially fired three practice rounds. One hit the parapet of an enemy fortification. One struck a house across the river near the water's edge. One fell near a Confederate horseman in a cornfield. He remarked that the shooting was good considering the distance and their lack of experience. On March 23rd, their captain, Oscar Penny, wrote to his wife, We leveled our guns twice yesterday at a gunboat that lie above us. She came around a point but did not get quite close enough to have our guns reach her. When she saw us, she pulled back. The Federal batteries were often fired upon from Confederate earthworks across the river, but only one man was killed. The 5th Wisconsin Battery was fortunate enough to lose none of their men during their time at New Madrid. A fleet of U.S. Navy ironclad gunboats, commanded by Andrew Foote, arrived on March 15th and began exchanging fire with the artillery on Island No. 10. The fleet fired over 200 shells on the first day alone, but after days of shelling, both sides remained at a stalemate. When General Pope requested that Commodore Foote send two or three gunboats to attempt running the blockaded Island No. 10 so that they could transport soldiers from New Madrid across the river, Foote refused, deeming it too dangerous. It was then proposed by Army engineers to bypass Island No. 10 by cutting a passage through the swamps of Wilson's Bayou to St. John's Bayou at New Madrid. U.S. troops labored, digging and cutting trees to create a channel 12 miles long and 50 feet wide. A special saw was devised to saw the trees four and a half feet below the water. Confederates were aware of the plan, but believed it was an impossible task. However, Yankee engineers finished the canal in 19 days, allowing four steamboats and several barges, but not the gunboats, to pass through to New Madrid. Finally, General Pope convinced Commodore Foote to allow one gunboat, the USS Carondelet, to attempt running past Island No. 10 on the night of April 4th. When that was successful, a second ironclad, the USS Pittsburgh, also made it past the blockade. Union forces were now prepared to cross into Tennessee. In New Madrid, the 5th Wisconsin Battery engaged in a fierce artillery duel with the enemy across the river. Some of the boys were buried in the trenches but miraculously remained unhurt. A few miles downstream, the two gunboats provided cover fire as four transport boats and four barges carried Union troops across the muddy river, 3,000 men at a time, to Tennessee. The rebels began to flee, but Federal troops quickly moved inland cutting off their retreat at Tiptonville, Tennessee. Real Foot Lake and the surrounding swamplands, which had previously provided a natural defense for the Confederates, now hemmed them in, preventing their escape. Confederate forces quickly surrendered Island No. 10 and the surrounding areas in Tennessee. It is estimated that 4,500 Confederate soldiers were captured and sent north. Newspapers across the country reported the victory at New Madrid and Island No. 10. The triumph over the Confederate stronghold opened the Mississippi River for the Federal gunboats to press further south. In less than two months, Memphis, Tennessee would be under Union control. However, any celebration of victory at Island No. 10 was tempered by shock from news coming from the Battle of Shiloh in southwest Tennessee and the horrific loss of lives of both Union and Confederate soldiers there. Both battles occurred on April 6 and 7, 1862. In a few days, soldiers from New Madrid would be on a riverboat steaming their way to reinforce federal troops in the standoff of the Confederates at Shiloh and nearby Corinth, Mississippi. While in New Madrid, Debbie and I visited the Historical Museum, which has exhibits of Civil War history and info on the major earthquakes which struck the area in 1811 and 1812. The earthquakes were felt as far away as Montreal in Canada and rang church bells in Boston, Massachusetts. Multiple eyewitnesses reported that the Mississippi River temporarily ran backwards. 
The uplifting of ground in places while sinking in others resulted in the overnight formation of the 15,000-acre Real Foot Lake and the swamplands on both sides of the river that later figured heavily into the Civil War history. A Confederate uniform on display which had belonged to a man named William Riley left us wondering if he was distantly related to Debbie. Would that put her relative fighting against mine? We didn't pursue that topic any further. Across the street from the museum is a replica of an underwater saw that was used to cut the trees below water level when building the canal that bypassed Island Number 10. On our way out of town, we roughly followed the route of the channel that was cut, but the large swamps were drained in land reclamation projects of the past century. Island Number 10 no longer exists due to the changing course of the Mississippi River over time. However, there is a monument at a nearby location in Tennessee that commemorates the Confederate strongholds at Island Number 10 and the battle that took place there. Leaving the boot heel of Missouri, we continued our quest to follow the journey of the 5th Wisconsin Battery on a steamboat rushing them to bolster the embattled federal troops near Shiloh on the banks of the Tennessee River. We hope you will join us in future videos to experience the battlefields where these brave boys fought for our nation. From Shiloh in Tennessee to Corinth, Mississippi, Chaplin Hills, Kentucky, Stones River and Chickamauga in Tennessee, Kennesaw Mountain in Georgia, and more. If you enjoyed this video, please help us by clicking on the like button, subscribing, and pressing on that notification bell so that you don't miss upcoming episodes. We appreciate you watching.